Science versus Pseudoscience, Part 3, with Imre Lakatosh. Welcome to Part 3 of my series on the demarcation between science and pseudoscience. If you haven't yet, I'd highly recommend you go watch Parts 1 and 2, links below, as they'll add some valuable context for the topics covered here. Nonetheless, I will provide a short recap of the ideas covered in those videos. Scientists and philosophers have long sought a clear and simple set of criteria by which one could differentiate between a truly scientific theory or set of theories and a pseudo-scientific imposter. It would be wonderful if we could determine the distinct features of science, properties which only apply to science and not its imposter. That way, when encountering something claiming to be scientific, all one would need to do would be to whip out their handy-dandy list of scientific properties, see if those properties actually apply to that thing claiming to be science. In my first video, I highlighted Karl Popper's falsifiability criteria, according to which a theory is truly scientific if and only if it makes clear what sorts of phenomena, if they were to be observed, would render the theory false. In other words, we cannot demarcate between science and other practices because it makes predictions which can later be verified. What makes science different from other practices is that it can be disproven. Thomas Kuhn thought that Popper's ideas were remarkably disconnected from what most scientists are doing most of the time when they're actually doing science. Most scientists, in what Kuhn calls normal science, never try to falsify their theories they're working with. Beyond that, it's not even clear that a scientist should abandon their theory or theories if an observation came along that seemingly disproved their theory. Most scientists, contrary to trying to falsify statements or system of statements, take the presuppositions of their field for granted and simply use those systems of statements to solve small puzzles. Beyond that, for Kuhn, Popper's account doesn't even accurately portray extraordinary or revolutionary science well. These changes in paradigms, a key term for Kuhn which I'd like to cover in more detail in later videos, doesn't occur because a theory was falsified. In fact, they often occur before a theory is proven false. It is clear that Popper's account, while likely having some limited value, doesn't accurately portray what the scientific practice is actually about. Imre Lakatosh disagreed with both Popper and Kuhn. He criticized Popper by saying that falsifiability criterion is a rather stunning one. A theory may be scientific even if there is not a shred of evidence in its favor, and it may be pseudoscientific even if all the available evidence is in its favor. That is, the scientific or non-scientific character of a theory can be determined independently of the facts. But he was equally critical of Kuhn, whom he saw as construing scientific revolutions as a largely irrational phenomenon dictated by group psychology. But what exactly did Lakatos himself think about the demarcation problem? In his essay, Science and Pseudoscience, it would be important to note that he begins his essay by pointing out that the question of demarcating between science and pseudoscience is of remarkable social importance. Lakatos himself, a Hungarian Jew who lived under Nazi occupation, as well as a dedicated communist who was imprisoned under charges of revisionism, was all too familiar with the real-world impact and implications of our demarcation. The demarcation problem is not a simple abstract problem that is only relevant to a handful of intellectuals or armchair philosophers, as Lakatos himself described it, quote, it is of vital social and political relevance. The social and political implications of what is deemed pseudoscience is on full display today, with those spreading misinformation about COVID or vaccines being removed from sites like YouTube and other social media platforms. For Lakatos, quote, the typical descriptive unit of great scientific achievement is not an isolated hypothesis, but rather a research program. Science is not simply a trial and error, a series of conjectures and refutations. Newtonian science, for instance, 
is not simply four conjectures, the three laws of mechanics and the law of gravitation. These four laws only constitute the, quote, hard core of the Newtonian program. But this hard core is tenaciously protected from refutation by a vast, quote, protective belt of auxiliary hypotheses. And, even more importantly, the research program also has a heuristic that is a powerful problem-solving machinery which, with the help of sophisticated mathematical techniques, digests anomalies and even turns them into positive evidence. It should be noted here that many things qualify as being a research program. Even Marxism and Freudianism qualify. But Lakatos didn't want to induct those two research programs into the realm of science. For Lakatos, a truly scientific research program must be marked by being able to predict novel or undreamt of facts. To illustrate this point, he brings up the story of Edmund Haley, who, while working within a Newtonian research program, predicted down to the minute when the comet that would become his namesake would return to the Earth's sky 72 years later. Before Newton, no one could have predicted such an event. He also illustrates this point by making note of a novel prediction under an Einsteinian research program. Namely, that if you measured the distance between two stars at night, and then measured the same stars during the day, only during an eclipse when you could actually see them, the measured distance would actually be different. Such a prediction could have not been thought of before the Einsteinian research program came into being. For Lakatos, these are the sorts of moments that are indicative of a truly scientific research program. It's no marker of success for a Newtonian research program to repeatedly drop a rock and have it fall, confirming his theory. Quote, what really counts are the dramatic, unexpected, stunning predictions. A few of them are enough to tilt the balance. Where theory lags behind the facts, we are dealing with miserable, degenerative research programs. This capacity to make novel predictions is the marker for true science for Lakatosh. This maneuver by Lakatosh kills two birds with one stone. First, as shown previously, he develops a plausible, though somewhat vague and non-explicit way to demarcate between science and pseudoscience. Second, his account can also explain how science goes through the so-called revolutions. He argues that, if we have two rival research programs, and one is progressing while the other is degenerating, the former is continually making novel predictions and the latter is not, scientists tend to join the progressive program. This is the rationale of scientific revolutions. The history of science refutes both Popper and Kuhn. On close inspection, both Popperian crucial experiments and Kuhnian revolutions turn out to be myths. What normally happens is that a progressive research program replaces a degenerating one. Lakatos ends his essay by reiterating his initial point. The demarcation problem is not some abstract, esoteric, ivory tower debate whose implications won't have impact beyond the offices of a few elite academics. How we demarcate between science and pseudoscience has direct and immediate impacts on us as social and political subjects. I'd like to say thanks for watching. Please come back for future videos in this series. I hope to cover further debate within the demarcation problem, as well as other topics within the philosophy of science. If you can and would like to support the future production of these videos, please support me on Patreon. Special shout out to my patron, Ryan Lindsay, for his monthly pledge. It means so much to me that you think that this content is worth your money. I sincerely appreciate all you do. If you're interested, also check me out on Facebook and Instagram for extra content. Links below. Again, thanks for watching.